to me, Conan was Robert E. Howard at, at his best. He's his great character and uh, one of the great heroes of, uh, you know, American popular literature. I think screenwriting is very similar to, to writing comics. I mean, both are visual medium, and you'll find, especially today, that there's a, a, a lot of uh, crossbreeding between comic book writers and artists and who are writing to film and film writing. my life. I had uh, worked for the competition DC Comics for two weeks. Um, I met Stan on my lunch hour because he had me take a little writing test and ten minutes later he offered me a job. Half hour later I was back at DC and quit. <laughs> you know, I would wanted to work for DC Comics for all these years and I went to work for Stan for like 15 and uh, we just had a wonderful experience. I would be there every morning uh, on his writer left hand you know uh, and he would go over what he had written the day before on Spider-Man or Fantastic Four or Thor and show why he did what he did and where to place the balloons. I mean, all these things I'd never thought about as a comics fan. You know, where do you put the balloons? How much dialogue can you get in a balloon? Uh, why do you avoid certain words, you know, maybe because letters will close up and they'll look like dirty words? You know, all sorts of strange things I never thought about. And it was just a real education. I was the one who had been the high school teacher for several years, but uh, I never liked that. Stan was just a great teacher. And uh, sometimes that would bear down a little heavy when it was on my work, but uh, it was a wonderful experience. When I got the rights for Marvel to, uh, to do Conan, we didn't have the right to adapt any stories. We just had the rights to use the character. It was deemed to be too complicated to get the rights to also adapt actual stories. I wasn't going to be happy until I got to adapt all these wonderful stories that I had read that I really loved. So I very quickly worked out with the literary agent for the estate, uh, Glenn Lord, to be able to pay a little extra we ended up being able to adapt all the great stories, starting with uh, the very fourth issue, which was Tower of the Elephant, one of the very best stories. And, uh, at, and a little later, we were able to get the rights to the other writers, such as L. Sprague de Camp, who had written a lot of Conan stories. And eventually, we were able to adapt almost, by the time I had left in 1980, we had adapted almost everything that anybody had ever written about Conan in prose up to that point. Stan had set the style for the Marvel writing, starting in the early 60s. And it was heavy on a lot of thought balloons. You know, Spider-Man was always thinking about, uh, you know, am I going to be able to get a date? Am I going to be able to pay for this or that? And all this teen angst and so forth that Marvel became known for. And also for great big gaudy sound effects, splang and patang. And Stan was great at inventing sound effects. Uh, when I started doing Conan about five years after I was working there, I decided we wanted to do something, I wanted to do something a little different from the usual Marvel comic. Uh, I just wanted it to have its own identity, so I omitted the thought balloons because in Howard's stories, you never really got inside Conan's mind. It never told you exactly what he was thinking. So uh, I decided I'd have captions that would give a little of that, but I would not have any thought balloons, and I would not have any nonverbal sound effect. If somebody screeches, ee, you know, that's okay, or a growl, but no nonverbals. And I'd been doing that for about a year or so, and then I had a story come in, and Stan looked at it and said, well, you know, this would be really good if it had a big splang right here where these two swords are hitting. And I told him, you know, I don't do nonverbal sound effects in the Conan comics, and he just stared at me in horror, you know, because that was part of his style. But he, he figured, well, by that time, the books were doing pretty well, so he said, well, I guess you're on to something, so he let it go. And uh, so I think there was one click that got in that somebody else put in once, but in, in all the thousands of pages I wrote, there was never a real sound effect or a thought balloon in Conan. And I, I thought that was kind of an interesting little experiment, very unusual for the time. Ed Pressman was interested in producing a Conan movie back in the middle 70s, 75, I guess it was. And um, a friend and associate of his, Ed Summer, who ran a uh, comic book store and art emporium in New York, was also a friend of mine. And he came to me one day and said that Ed Pressman would love to get in touch with some of the people who controlled Conan, and I explained to him, well, they weren't speaking to each other. <laughs> you know, they, there were feuds, and that's been a problem. So I introduced him to the literary agent, and pretty soon they all got together on this Conan Properties Incorporated, and it was, the, it was putting all these various people together into one group that made the Conan movie possible, even though it took another, what, six or seven years before the movie actually uh, got made. And the reason the comics were so important at that time was because the books were not coming out. Uh, the Conan books had come out from the middle 60s through the very late 60s from Lancer books, but Lancer had uh, gone into Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So for a period of several years, 
in the late 70s and so forth through the early 80s, the Conan stories were not available in prose form. So people only knew Conan through the comics. But luckily, we're selling, you know, a quarter of a million or so every month of Conan. And then we had the black and white book by uh, the middle 70s, and that was a big item. So that made, that as much as anything helped make the movie possible, even though, of course, the authentic Conan was always Robert E. Howard. Ed Pressman had paid me for the work on the um, Conan the Barbarian movie, a story consultant, and that was fine with me. And I couldn't write another sword and sorcery movie for about one year, but nobody was asking me to anyway, so I figured, what the heck, I'll take 10 years of that. And um, so in the meantime, uh, the first movie came out, and it was nice, and it did very well. And then one day, I get a call from Ed, and whom I you know, got along with very well, but I hadn't heard from him for many months, and he suddenly, and he's asking me, well, how are you, what are you doing these days? I said, well, my partner Jerry Conway and I, we just wrote an animated sword and sorcery film for uh, Ralph Bakshi called Fire and Ice, and we sold a couple of other movies, and uh, he said, oh, that's very interesting. He says, you know, we're about to start working on the second uh, Conan movie, and I've got a young uh, Australian, New Zealand director, Roger Donaldson, to do it. And he said, you know, you should come in, you and your partner should come in, and we should talk about maybe you writing it, and, uh, because, you know, you've got this experience now, and, you know, and so forth. And I said, well, that's great. But I know that this is not what Ed called about, because he didn't know this. So I keep thinking, what is it he called about? Uh, I didn't get a lot of calls from producers, you know, ordinarily. So uh, just at a certain point, there comes this thing I call the Columbo moment, when Ed, it sounds like the conversation's over, and then Ed says, um, oh, by the way, <laughs> you know, like Columbo pausing at the door. He says, by the way, he says, you remember that I paid you for being the story consultant on Conan the Barbarian? And I'm thinking, oh boy, he's going to do it again for the second movie, you know, and uh, that's great. And he says, well, Dino De Laurentiis is now sort of in as, you know, co-producing the, uh, the second movie uh, in a bigger way than the first. And he says, and he's supposed to pay me back all the expenses that I paid out for the first movie. And he's written me a check, but it's made out to you. So then I see the reason for the call. He needs me to sign the check over to him so he can cash it. And I said, sure, you know, send somebody over. Maybe it took 10 minutes for somebody to get there. I said, I'll sign it. I got my money. I no, no problem. And, but because of this accident of his needing me to sign the check, he found out that we had some movie credits. And as a result, writing the first several drafts of the second Conan movie, and it was just one of these weird accidents that, uh, that I kind of lucked into. Our goal when we came onto this was to do the Conan of the books and of the, the comics, which we didn't really feel had been accomplished in the first film. Roy and I discovered that it worked really well for me to write the first scene and get to the point where I was burning out. Then he would take over and then he would continue writing until the point that he was burning out. Then I would be rejuvenated by that point and come back in. And so we just basically tag teamed uh, the script. Mm -hmm. The movie contained a lot of things that were taken either from Howard's original stories or from the comic books. The most noticeable, Zula. A few years earlier when I was writing Conan, I had wanted to make up a black hero. Uh, I felt there should be a black hero who was sort of like a Conan type. I gave him sort of vaguely hypnotic magical powers to make him sort of sword and sorcerer in one person. I was combi combining Mandrake the magician and his assistant Lothar into one character is what it really was. And I named the character Zula because the A ending in a lot of African language is masculine rather than feminine in English. So I thought Zula was a nice name, kind of typical comic booky name taken from Zulu. We wanted somebody different from the blonde Valeria in the first movie, so we, we, and so we thought a black Amazon warrior type would be very good. And we just stuck the name Zula on uh, because it had been in the comics and it sounded kind of feminine, even though in the comics it had been a man. And it was supposed to be just a holding name, you know, until we thought of something better. And people kind of began to like Zula, so we just ended up keeping it. So there are two Zulas. In the comic book, there's the man, and in the movie, there's the woman. And uh, as we were discussing between ourselves earlier, the casting of Grace Jones was something that uh, I can't say that we were directly responsible for, but we came up with the idea of using someone like Grace Jones. A lot of the scenes in the movie look like the scenes we wrote, you know, and so forth. They're, uh, you know, they're not the same, but they're similar or they're based on them or whatever. But one scene that um, Richard Fleischer and Stanley Mann, between them, added totally uh, was the introduction of Zula, in which you see her surrounded by an, uh, an angry army of villagers, and she's tethered by one leg, and she's having to hold them off before he rescues her. And that was entirely their invention. 
Valeria uh, was the love interest in the first movie, uh, although she's only named in the credits. Somehow the name never quite made it into the movie as it got edited. But uh, she was killed. So one of the comics I had done, in fact, the very last Color Conan I had done, 10 years anniversary issue, uh, had a sorcerer promising to bring his lady love, who wasn't Valeria but was the same kind of character, to life if he would do this, you know, rather unpleasant task for him. And Conan was very tempted to do it. And at the end, he decides he can't do it. It just isn't right to do. So he foregoes the chance of bringing his beloved back to life and so forth. And uh, near the end of the, uh, as Jerry and I were working on the fourth draft, or really the fifth draft of the film, and Richard Fleischer was the director coming in, uh, we, I remember telling Richard, you know, uh, I said, you know, about this element, which they didn't want me to do originally, but I thought, gee, maybe it was time to add that back in. And uh, he really sparked the idea, so I loaned him a copy of that comic book, and that ended up making its way into the movie and gave it a little bit of a, um, uh, an extra motivation for Conan and a tie-in with the first movie, which I rather liked. In other cases, we had to leave things out. For example, uh, we had wanted to have, in particular, I wanted to have that giant spider. Uh, it was supposed to be a spider the size of a pig, uh, it was described by uh, Howard, in the story The Tower of the Elephant. And we had that all ready to go uh, in the movie uh, when we were working on it, and we had a meeting with an executive on another project at another studio, and he started to tell us about this sword and sorcery science fiction movie they were making, you know, called Crawl, and it had a crystal spider in it, a giant crystal spider. So there went that idea, because it would just look like we were copying the other movie if it came out first. So we started thinking about what are we going to do instead of the spider, so we made up this idea of leeches. I guess the African queen with Humphrey Bogart was part of the <laughs> inspiration. Conan was going to swim through a sewer that went under the tower, come up through a grating into a subterranean vault that had these holes in the wall that start off as little tiny holes where you see little tiny leeches. And then as you get climb up the vault, you know, the holes start getting bigger and the leeches get bigger until you're up near the very top of the vault and there's this giant hole the big moment of this film. And it survived through every single draft and all the changes that you know we incorporated for, uh, for Dino uh, until the end. One of the recurring uh, story points that we, we had was this battle of the gods. And one of the bad gods was gonna be this god Dagoth that was uh, the, uh, the evil the evil god. He was the devil. He was the devil. Yeah. And we wanted to have him have wings and fly, and we're going to have a big battle on top of a cliff and all of this. Uh, so uh, I think some of that is in the, uh, survived in the comic book version. Of, yeah, well, all of it survived in the comic book version. <laughs> yeah, well, it was sort of the alternate, the alternate movie version. And we were going to have this, this spectacular fight where in, in midair with Conan having to hack away at this uh, giant bat-like creature. Uh, and again, as I say, financially, this would have been enormous. I mean, because we didn't have digital effects back then. And Dino, uh, rightly, probably given the fact that uh, opticals at that point were fairly crude, uh, did not want to have any optical effects in the film if he could avoid it. So I guess we knew going along as we were progressing along that a lot of our uh, bigger moments weren't going to survive. But most of the process of doing the five drafts was in whittling down you know, the original visuals, you know, to something that was